again. Um, as promised, we'll talk about modernism. I will talk very briefly about the period as such. And I will also try talking about one single book that you will probably love and uh, that, you will, that will give you a very good idea of what modernism is. So, in the title slide, we have this lovely picture here. Maybe you know it, maybe you've seen it somewhere. It's the picture of London in the fall. So, with the Tower of London and the House of London, the Westminster Palace. The thing is, it is not a picture you would normally well, imagine when, when they, they will tell you. Imagine the House of Parliament or imagine Big Bang. However, you definitely understand that you might see those real buildings and that water like that. So, in a sense, modernism very much alters our idea of what literature and what art is. So, the first thing, let's talk about the historical context of modernism. Uh, when we talk about modernism in literature, we normally think of a period from uh, roughly 1900 to 1945. However, the problem is that it actually did not start at that point. It started earlier, uh, as early as 18, uh, 1890s. Uh, and it actually did not exactly stop in 1945. Because certain people who were like icons of modernism, they passed away much earlier than that. Others who worked in that period did not work within the modernist tradition at all. So, big date. 1887, Queen Victoria's Jubilee. Uh, in, uh, so, Queen Victoria, well, turned on, she was pretty old at that point already. So, she was for, for 50 years already, she was on the throne. And that was a long time, 50 years is a time span for, for two generations of people. And it, well, the people who remember it felt the sense of, the sense of an ending. So it can't go on like this. We, the world is rapidly changing. And the, uh, the image of monarchy, the image of power, and the image of the country that Queen Victoria represents did not exactly fit. Then 1901, Queen Victoria dies. Actually, it is the first year of the 20th century. And quite a lot of people in the arts, in music, in literature, very acutely understood that this was an official end of Victorian age. It started to go away slightly in the 90s and her death officially marked this, was the watermark. Here it ends. Then, uh, next big event, the Boer War. Uh, the, first, uh, the first big colonial war for England in the South Africa. Some people might call it a rehearsal, a training ground for the First World War. So it was the first war that was fought on modern principles. Uh, machine guns, atrocities, concentration camps, uh, terrorizing uh, civil population. Um, so all those bad things we will see in the First World War and in the Second World War were actually deeply rooted in there. And the war will also mark the dissatisfaction with the empire. Quite a lot of intellectuals at that point started to think that British Empire has outlived itself and should gradually go. Some thought that, that everything was pretty much all right. And this event gave rise to a, a huge uh, tradition in, in literature, the anti-colonial, post-colonial 
and neo-colonial writing. So writing about living in colonies, being from a colony, working in a colony, and saying goodbye. Then there's the big thing, First World War. Uh, it is the war that actually changed Europe completely. It was the war that was, or it was the, one of the biggest wars since uh, the Napoleonic Wars. It really encompassed the whole world, so the whole world took part in it. Uh, quite literally, people from all across the globe. It laid waste to huge parts of the, uh, of the European continent. It simply wiped out the whole generation of young people. Uh, you, uh, for Britain, again, it was important also in the sense that there were only three villages in England where everybody who went to war returned. So in proportion to the population, the death toll was enormous. Uh, so it was even more acutely felt at the time than the war, uh, than the Second World War, even. And again, uh, for the first time people saw what ap apocalypse might look like. Chemical, uh, chemical weapons, gas attacks, uh, mass, uh, uh, so huge battles where millions of people were killed in just a few days with no result at all. So the war was fought for four, four years. It resulted in the collapse of German, uh, German Empire and the dissolution of monarchy in Germany. The collapse of Austro-Hungarian Empire, hence no monarchy there. It resulted in the fall of Russian Empire with the rise of communists and well, Bolsheviks and then communists. As a result, a huge new, well, uh, a new country built on the principles never seen before, the communist principles, was established. And that was again, well, again, food for thought. Food for thought. Uh, and it, it of course, it influenced art. As for the very first time, you had people commenting on the war from a slightly different perspective. Not in the sense people wrote about war uh, in the 19th century, where you have nice pictures, battle scenes, uh, heroic poems, but rather you had poetry and prose writing from the battlefield by the people who were actually fighting and who saw all the horrors of war. And this was a very unpleasant memory. Uh, at the very same time, we have a huge population who returned from the war deeply wounded psychologically, shell shocked, or suffering as we now call it post traumatic stress disorder. People who had to cope with mental problems, mental illnesses, due to the fact that due to the, to the events that happened to them. Uh, there is uh, so their mental destabilized health was the result of the horrors of war they had to go through. And again it was uh, that gave uh, the rise to a whole generation of poets uh, called the trench poets, or in Russian they are known as by it. Then, Easter Rising in Ireland happens as uh, the backdrop for the First World War. Back on the home front in Ireland, the Irish who have been oppressed by the English crown since the 17th century fight for independence. In, on Easter 1916 there is a huge uprising in, in Dublin and in Belfast and all across Ireland. And again the, this was fueled by literature and literature responded to that. Uh, a, uh, again, uh, you for the first time you see what fighting for your freedom looks like. So, what a terrorist, what terrorist warfare would uh, would look like in the future. And the East Rising of 1916 uh, had a long-lasting effect. Only in 1994, nearly a hundred years later, this problem of Northern Ireland and 
the Republic of Ireland was more or less settled. Then, 1819, uh, so 18, uh, 1918, uh, 1919, collapse of European monarchies. Again, I started talking about it a bit earlier, but for Britain it was a big challenge. The people thought, right, the Germans kicked away their monarchy, the, or the Austrians and the Hungarians, and all those countries in Europe, they kicked out their monarchy. The Russians had kicked out their monarchy. For do we need monarchy? And this was a big challenge for, for the ruling classes and, uh, and gave a lot of, well, and gave some food for thought for those who were rioting. Okay, 1922 uh, Ireland gains independence. Uh, again, Britain start well, uh, this British Empire starts creating step by step to fall apart. Ireland was the first to go. Uh, the last to go in 1997 would be Hong Kong. So the, uh, so the collapse, the idea of collapse is there. That 1992 collapse of the New York Stock Exchange. The big the first big financial crisis in, in Western civilization. Just in a few days, the whole of Western world became poor. Well, uh, well, when people have nothing to eat, when people have no jobs, well, they start thinking, why is that happening? And of course, uh, well, for some people, the world well, ceased to exist. And again, literature responded to it. Well, 1933, the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany. Uh, again, for the first time we in, uh, in Western civilization, we see a real threat for humanity. As, as, would, as it would be later known in after, after the war, after 1945. Uh, the Nazi regime was probably one of the cruelest political regimes ever. And, uh, but at the time, Hitlerism and as Nazi ideology was thought as a good option. So it's very difficult to understand this now, but for quite a lot of people writing, uh, writing at that time and thinking, Hitler was not a bad guy at all. Well, until probably uh, this one and this one. So, the Spanish Civil War. Again, uh, some people call it a rehearsal for the Second World War. Uh, 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 why it's important for Britain? Well, quite a lot of people who were writing, especially uh, uh, George Orwell, uh, the author of The Animal Farm in 1984. Uh, took part in it. Um, so it shapes for uh, it shaped quite a lot of writers who were writing after the war that war doesn't uh, da uh, doesn't work. Uh, it influenced a lot of painting. If you remember Picasso, his picture Guernica, uh, the most famous picture by Picasso, is an artistic reaction to the war. Then of course this big event, the Second World War, that. Uh, totally, well, all those who were at least more or less optimistic about the future of humankind well, lost their optimism altogether after that. In 1940, uh, the toughest time for Britain and the time still reflected in art, 1940, uh, Poland fell, France fell, the Soviet Union is, is at this point on Hitler's side, we are allied with Hitler at that point. America is not yet at war. Uh, Japan is doing something else, they are not at war. So Britain is at this point, well, Norway fell. At this point, 1940, Britain is against Hitler on its own. The Battle of Britain becomes. So invasion of Britain becomes um, very likely to put it mildly. And some looked at it as a disaster, and some think of it as the moment that reshaped England uh, uh, and gave some, well, gave a kind of kick for, for the British to think, okay, right, what is it like to be British? So, who are we actually? Are? How do we identify ourselves? And the last one, the last one, 
actually mark the end of the so-called modern era, 1945, uh, new world order after the fall of Germany and nuclear strike on, on Japan. Uh, humanity, well, conclusively showed that it can destroy itself. Now, well, uh, now we as animals can technically turn our lovely planet Earth into planet which is more like Moon or Mars. No life, nothing. And again, that gave me some fuel to pessimism. So, this is a pretty pessimistic view. Uh, so, this, this is the history that was going on, and very well, a lot of people felt that, oh my god, where are we going? However, if we look at the intellectual picture, cultural context, we'll see more interesting. So we have cultural backdrop. 1970s, well, this was very much before um, the modern era. However, the, the education reform stated that education for all children aged from 5 to 13 should be compulsory. It meant that every child aged from 5 to 13 had to go to school, had to learn how to read, how to write, uh, how to count, well, some basics of sciences, basics of history, well, and then at the age of 13 you normally went to work, unless you were from uh, upper classes. Uh, what does it result in? It results that by the beginning of the First World War you had a reading and writing population on the front line, so people wanted to express themselves. They wanted to share what they saw, both in, both in form of poetry and in form of prose. And they wanted to read something. Well, they wanted to read something even before the war. So during the war it just few, it was fueled up with it. So there was a huge demand for reading, for book, and also a huge, uh, uh, and a huge desire to express itself also through literature not just to run. Then, a bit earlier than that, 1859, Charles Darwin publishes The Origin of Species. Well, this is the mid of Victorian era. However, The Origin of Species uh, showed that we are no more than the product of evolution. And God is obviously not much there. Now imagine a society that strongly relied on God both in terms of philosophy, in terms of morals, and in terms of creation. Well, if creation is not godly, how morals can be? And the idea of what is moral, what is not, the idea of, of good and bad, started to, to shake it, it started to drift which resulted in moral relativism and resulted in complete rethinking of uh, social philosophy on completely new, more biological ground. Well, later, in the, uh, in the very 20th century, this would result in very interesting forms of writing. Then, a huge book, The Golden Bow, James Fraser. Uh, maybe you, uh, well, in Russian, Zlatai Vyat. Maybe you heard about this, but maybe not. Just not the best book I've ever read. However, uh, it completely, it had completely taken religion out of intellectual discourse. Uh, well, the Golden Bow actually uh, explores a myth. Uh, of, of an ancient religion where, where you had to, with your sword, go around the tree and be the incarnation of God. So as long as you are alive with the sword to protect yourself from the others, you are the God, the, well, kind of the embodiment of the God. So, but, when, uh, but, there is, but if you want to be the of God, you have to kill the previous. So in other words, uh, Religion is not about anything else but simply tradition, myth, and it is universal. 
and what is more, it doesn't stand any scientific criticism. However, it's a bit simplistic, but uh, for many people, it, it marked, it was the embodiment of the idea, religion is not there. Well, it is not something that can keep us going anymore. We can't rely on religion. So, big ideas, Marxism, Karl Marx, the father of communism, the person of whose ideas this country tried to build its future and to be successful. Marxism was a big thing. Quite a lot of young, well, and relatively clever, well, actually very clever people, uh, thought that it is a good way out from the current social and, and economic and political climate. Uh, again, that was important. Fascism. Again, a, well, something on the opposite from Marxism. A very, very right-wing philosophy. However, was still very popular with a lot of intellectuals in the time. And again, they, they were very big ideas. Italy was the first fascist state to, to be built on this principle, and it lasted even longer than the Nazi Germany. Spain turned to fascism after, uh, after the Spanish Civil War and continued to go on as a fascist state for, well, until the 70s. Portugal actually it took this turn pretty much in the same years and also made it for 40 years. And quite a lot of people were sharing these ideas and expressing them through art, through painting, through literature, through cinema, through film. Then Ernst Mach, long oh, before that, Freud. So, is it, well, you know Sigmund Freud, yes? From your courses of psychology. So, you more or less know about Freud's approach to psychology. So, his theory of neurosis, his, uh, well, uh, theories of, well, of I and the it, or the super I, the ego, well, sexual things. But what is more, Freud introduced two very important concepts. The concept of subjectivity of mind, so there, there is no objective reality. What, we, what is objective to us is actually very, very subjective because it's there in our mind. And the subconscious, so certain things we do and certain things we see and feel, we do this not consciously, we are not aware of what we are doing, but rather subconsciously. And in order to dig down to that, you have to use hypnosis. We have to experiment with the mind state. And literature very quickly jumps at this, because, well, if you how can you show this? How can you experiment with the mind? And they will let you tell you how it, how it happened. Then, in, in, uh, in natural sciences, we have Ernst Mach, an Austrian uh, well, physicist initially. Uh, he stated that, well, um, uh, that we only can uh, talk about scientific phenomena like gravity, electricity, anything, uh, only we're speaking from our own experiences. So if we can experience it, then we can talk about it. If we can't experience it, we can't talk about it. At the very same time, you have, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have Einstein with his theory of relativity, so everything is relative. So all, all, uh, all things, all time, space, mass, energy, they are all related. And the world uh, works on slightly different principles as, as proposed by Isaac Newton uh, in the 18th century. So, well, you don't know, so uh, now um, imagine what the people felt. You believed in objective reality in the Victorian age. Well, Freud takes this away from you. You think, well, right, when the world is real, it's objective, we have Newton, we have Newton physics. No. Well, this state of uncertainty resulted in new, interesting ideas, like the ideas of Carl Jung. Do you remember Carl Jung? No? So, Carl Jung. His idea of collective subconscious. Well, can you can you see this slide or well, this one blocks it? Okay. So the idea of collective 
subconscious. According to Jung, people, all of us as a, as a nation, as a group, we have those, uh, those thoughts, these ideas that we share but we can't express them. But if we uh, try to, to, well, to focus what we say on our collective subconscious, we can, uh, we can deliver lots of interesting ideas and get lots of interesting ideas out of people. Well, Friedrich Nietzsche, again, an important philosopher, thinker and writer, introduced the idea of willful power. So, all our life is willful power. Yes, it is more or less few, well, some people argue that ideas of Nietzsche uh, sort of helped this to rise. Well, probably they did. But Nietzsche also, well, with his writing, he said, well, people struggle for power, they want power. And there is nobody else but man, because God is there. It was the, uh, these are Nietzsche's words. And again, for some people, Nietzsche was the uh, this embodiment of pessimism. Others looked at his ideas as a proof for human opportunity. Yes, you can take everything in your hands and get the power you want. It can be any sort of power, it can be political power, it can be moral power, it can be emotional power, it can be psychological power. And literature explores this struggle for power and what does the power bring together with it. And of course we have new forms of expression, new art, we have cubism, we have impressionism, we have uh, futurism, we have symbolism, we have all those interesting well, uh, manifestations of art depicting not the world as it is, but rather the world as we, as we see and understand it. Probably all of you have been to the theatrical gallery, yes? You, you have been. And you have probably seen this amazing picture by Kazimir Malevich, the black square, yeah? Well, strangely enough, the black square, uh, well, a child of three can do this, yeah? Well, but uh, the point with art, well, it is more than art, is not to give you, well, to give you the picture of here is the ship, here is the sea, here, here are the skies. No, we give you some, something to interpret, something to look at, something to make you think. Uh, art is now not there to make you feel uh, well, feel nice and, uh, and understand everything. Art is now meant to be difficult to understand and requires some intellectual effort. Not, it, is not, it is there not simply for the purposes of uh, uh, for the purposes of giving you artistic or aesthetic pleasures. It is there to make you feel something. So, this is culture. Now let's look at literature. And we'll start with poetry. Uh, so, normally, poetry uh, in, in any literary period goes a bit ahead. Uh, when, we, uh, when we talk of a new period in, in literature, we always think of poetry because it is very quick to respond to new things. Well, it's uh, well. A poem is relatively short. It's easier to write. Well, accurately easier to write. So, poetry uh, of the modern age relied heavily on two uh, big ideas: on aesthetism and decadence. So, aesthetism. Uh, when we talk of aesthetism, we talk of Oscar Wilde. Well, you have probably read the picture of Dorian Gray or Sid. Or, or anything else by, uh, by this writer. But the, um, but the major idea of aestheticism is the following. Art is there, uh, anything, literature, music, painting, is there not to tell you something, to tell you how to live, but to show how beautiful something can be. So, 
Her art is there for the sake of art in itself. If we look at decadence uh, from the French word, well, it's actually the French word decadence, which means decline, fall. Um, again, uh, if you remember the, the historical events that we talked about a bit earlier today, um, if the world is going down in, in shambles, obviously, well, humanity is going down in shambles. And we will all die, it's all sad, and let's write a point about it. Well, this is the dance. This, uh, well, uh, the decadence movement tried to show the, this pessimism, this gloom, this, um, how to put it nicely, uh, the sense that the world is, is, is soon to end. And they were not totally wrong. Okay. Uh, Poet returns to urban themes as compared to with Victorian literature well, uh, and Victorian poetry. If you remember when we talked about uh, Tennyson and uh, uh, and Matthew Arnold, but the settings are rural. They were in the countryside. Well, near the well uh, near the shores of the ocean. Of here, well, action normally takes place in a city, and uh, and the explanation is very very simple. Uh, Eleven, well, uh, more than seventy percent of the population now lives in the cities, in Britain at least. So uh, poets are writing not for rural readers, but rather rather for urban readers who do not see lovely English countryside every day, but rather they see gloomy cities and, well, things that are far from green lawns and daffodils of the romantic era. Um, the next important thing is what type of poems you write. If we look at our poetry of the Victorian era. We have long narrative poems. Poems that try to tell us something. Poems that, uh, that tell you a story, narrative poems. In, in modernist poetry, uh, the philosophy is slightly different. You write a poem in order to grasp the moment you are writing the poem in, you, uh, you just look at something and immediately the lines start to appear. Uh, so it is, the, uh, it, is the, it is the poetry that tries to grasp the sense of the everyday, the feelings that you can experience right now and what you experience right now. Again, we see a very similar thing in the Romantic age but from a slightly different perspective, less urban and uh, with, uh, well, uh, with a slightly different philosophy behind it. Right, For, uh, again, the next big change. If, again, if we look at Matthew Arnold or, um, or, or Alfred Tennyson, we will see in most poems a lot of verbal linguistic decorum. So, you use very sophisticated, very beautiful, rare words in order to be precise what you want to say, in order to make your poem look really poetic. Here, very much like in the Romantic Age, this switches to the ordinary language, the language spoken by, by ordinary people. Some, we, uh, modernist poets use accent, use uh, original variation of the language, use slang, use well everyday idiom in order to achieve this, to give you the immediate sense of the moment. And just to be, mm, well, just not, uh, not to be too much, well, uh, not, not to give a, a too big a lie, I will try to furnish you with uh, with an ex 
example uh, so yes um, uh, uh, for example in terms terms uh, well in ter well, terms terms adult or Huga I will mention in the next slide well in his poem the wasteland uh, especially uh, the section the burial of the dead gives a very striking image of the people moving along the streets in London. A crowd uh, flowed over London Bridge. Flow is like well, when you have grass, long grass in the wind going like this. Uh, flowed over London Bridge so many, I had not thought death had undone so many. Oh, and this was, and this was a very weird kind of poetry. Because normally the boy says, well, look, those people, they look like grass. I wonder why they are not all dead, they should be dead. Interesting. And it's, it's really troubling, you never, you never, well, you may have thought that, but you never wrote that. And, uh, and this word, un, uh, well, you undo somebody, quite colloquial at that point, something you would not expect a poet to write. And stylistic mixing and language mix. Um, for many modernist poets, one language was not enough and one style was not enough. As a result, we have poems with Latin and French lines inserted in order to give you a sense, well, in order to, to touch different strings in, in you, to hint at other. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and other parts of your of your inner self, and uh, uh, and again we see a lot of this in, for example, in in trench poetry, on the first world world of poetry, when you have the first opening line from Cicero, and then you have very bitter writing about well, uh, so, well dulce et decorum est propate morti well how pleasant it is to die for your country. And then you say, well, it's actually not pleasant, it's awful and ugly. And you have this mixture of styles, well, uh, this Roman ode, and you have this uh, soliloquy of a soldier saying, well, death is actually ugly and they don't want to die. Well, and if we have to narrow us down to one poet, of the modern era, I would say to the Thomas Stearns Eliot, or as he uh, published as T.S. Eliot. So before we pass on to his critical perspective, I will try to give you a bit of his biography just to give you the sense of, of, well, of just who was well, who was the embodiment of, of, of modernism. So Eliot is initially an American poet. His parents moved from England, some, well, a very well, not his parents, his ancestors moved from England a very long time ago. In 1914, Eliot returns to England from America and claims British citizenship, so he becomes a British subject. Um, and continues to be a British subject for a very long time, then again says he doesn't want to be a British subject anymore, and then goes back to America. Again, but, well, goes back to America, gets his American citizenship back, then returns to England where he dies and where he is buried. Uh, so Eliot was not a person who wrote particularly a lot. So he did write a few plays, uh, he wrote quite a lot of poetry, not much, but still a lot. And he, he was a very, quite prolific as a, an essayist as, and as a person who commented on the poetry. So, the first thing, the most important thing, he breaks away from Romantic tradition and from Georgian, uh, Georgian tradition. So, in what way does he break away from these traditions. First of all, he did not 
want to use the models introduced by the Romantics and by Georgian poets in the sense that his poetry is not, uh, uh, well, is completely different. It is more, um, uh, let's say, uh, he uses it in the language in a slightly different way. Uh, he uses, uh, well, the images that are completely foreign for romantic poets. Well, um, well, a very, uh, a very famously, uh, in one of the, in one of the, with his poems, he. He writes that the sun, well, normally you would use a lovely metaphor for, for the sun. The sun is golden brown thing. Well, well the sun all the land, it's like a person who is given a, a, an ecstasy before an operation, before being cut, cut uh, off or cut open. Well, it's not an image you would normally use. So, well, his image is very struggling. Uh, at the very same time, he is very experimental in terms of form and content. This is uh, interesting because Eliot, unlike many, many poets of his time, did not experiment with blank verse or free verse, meaning uh, his poetry is a very good rhyming poetry. And as he himself said, I have really no time for free verse because it doesn't exist. Um, uh, he writes about uh, things that are that other people would not uh, would not write before. He heavily relies on uh, uh, on imagery that doesn't show something directly, rather on the imagery that aims to invoke in you certain thoughts. So you are given a hint and then you have to imagine things yourself. It's, it is sometimes very difficult to grasp. Uh, uh, for example, his images are uh, distorted, they are not harmonious, they obscure, they are obscure, they are aimed to build you. Again, uh, from the way Slab we have this lovely, these lovely lines. What is the city over the mountains? Cracks and tree forms and bursts of violet air. Falling towers, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, Vienna, London, unreal. Well, Christ, it's not the point you understand just off oh, and you get it. Well, you have, to, you have to think. In this sense, it's experimental. What do you write about? What kind of images can you put in? How do you write poems? How do you organize them in collections? Again, Eliot was good at this. Then, another shocking and bewildering images from urban life. So, uh, 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 he writes about things that are akin to the right to, the, to his readers. The things that his readers would normally see, factories, well, people being unhappy with their urban lives, people being alienated, people living through mental crises and, and being unable to effectively communicate with others, people suffering from depression, people suffering from pain, uh, well, all sorts of things. Uh, people with no ideas to to think of and uh, feeling bad about it. So, not the kind of feeling you you get in, in the countryside. So, another important thing about him is his sense of an age. Uh, so, Edward uh, quickly understands and very, uh, very well grasps this idea that he is writing at a time when nothing is uh, solid, nothing is understandable, nothing is clear. So how do you do this? Well, if 
the world is so unclear, so murky, so floating. Well, we have to be floating and stuff. And you should write about it. Hence his most famous poem, The Wasteland, basically the land that destroyed by something. Written in 1922. Well, the photo is actually taken pretty much at that time. It's 23, I guess. 1923 photo. So, he is writing after the set after the First World War. Of course, well, Europe is a wasteland, well, destroyed by bombs and uh, shells and whatnot. But he is writing about an intellectual and emotional and cultural wasteland. So, the big, this big crisis of culture. And Edel tries to cross when everything is dying, the world is dying, or civilization is dying. Well, and this is going to happen. Uh, poetry impersonalized by tradition. Well, this is a bit tricky. In, uh, in Elliot's view, any poet is right. It has, of course, his or her own voice. But this voice kind of disappears when you are writing within certain literary tradition, uh, meaning that there is no person Eliot's voice, rather his voice is simply the embodiment of all the voices which are now there and he is simply speaking on behalf of his generation. And this idea of speaking on behalf of your generation very acutely Mm. Uh, well, uh, very acutely manifests itself in his poetry I'm, and would later create this idea that the writers are those who know better who know how we should live, who can tell what we cannot tell uh, which of course in the later periods resu uh, resulted in this um, response saying well we are we writers, we are not responsible for anything we just write for the sake of love and for the sake of fun and then you get post this. and the thing, quotation and delusion is a form of communication to community again, tricky uh, a trip, uh, well, as attributed uh, well, well uh, there is a phrase often attributed to Eliot that uh, bad poets borrow from good poets good poets steal from good poets um, so, uh, poetry of Eliot and many of his contemporaries heavily relies on using quotations from others. So, you are there to recognize the quotation or to understand what he's hinting at. Uh, he is also alluding as well, you can allude at the Bible in the ways that he alludes at Dante's Inferno. Uh, and this is the way how um, Eliot and generally modest poetry communicates with its readers. If you can understand the allusion and you can understand the quotation and you know where it leads you, finally we have communication established between the poet and the reader and we have a sense of community. If you, if you don't get it, well sorry, don't get it, you're not my reader. The result of this uh, was that modest poetry, even now, is considered to be elitist and posh and not for everybody. However, it is very much for everybody, you just simply have to be a more attentive reader. Okay, this was Eckhart. So, his major of so peripheral and other observations, which, is, which, was the, which was the poetry collection that gave him, uh, well, the, the, that gave him fame and made him well, made his name. Then the way is that his major poem. Then goes well, Mariana, a longish narrative poem. Well, then comes a, a very interesting book, old Boston's book of practical cats. Uh, many of you probably know the Broadway musical The Cats. Do you know it? Cats. No, you don't. Well, it, well, it is. Well, it, well, I do really recommend that you watch it. It's available. It's a Broadway musical. Well, turn it to a Broadway musical. Well, it's actually well a collection of poems about cats, and this and this is very nice and pleasant uh, reading. Well, very well presented into Russian. I, I will highly recommend. So, with Eliot, well, in Russian, it's simply Koshka. And you 
you will, uh, well, you can read it. It's it's marvelous and nice, and it can uh, well, and and this is a very good example of how a modernist poetry works. It works basically on two levels. You can read it as funny, chill, even children's poems about cats that you can even learn by heart. Or you can look at cats as metaphors for certain kinds of people or certain kinds of emotions or certain kinds of uh, social relations. And then it gives you um, another sense. Or you can again uh, look at, at it from, from a completely different perspective, how a modernist poet would look at a cat. Uh, and, and look at the naming of a cat. Again, the opening point, the naming of cats, uh, which is again a very, a very good and very, uh, a, a, a very, well, a very nice example of accessible modernist poetry. So it's very, very simple. Uh, the naming of cats is a difficult matter. It isn't just one of your holiday games. You may think at first I'm as mad as a hatter. When I tell you a cat, you must have three different names. Well, very simple language, yeah? You have idiom, mad as a cat. You would not see this in, in Victorian or Romantic poetry. And you would not see this colloquial tone in poetry before adult. Well, but you can see a lot of it now. And of course, the four quarters are a, a much later poem which in a sense marks the end of modernist tradition since it tells us that well this is all uh, modernism could tell us. Uh, so moving on, modernist novel. Again, uh, since, uh, since the 18th century, novel is there, it's a big thing. Novel was even a bigger thing in the Victorian era. When it comes to the modern, uh, to the modern age, we normally think of novel. Again, novel is reborn as a genre. The thing is that people were pretty much fed up with the Victorian novel in the sense that it no longer could reflect the way people thought and the way people felt. Now imagine, you have all those nice theories uh, and of philosophy and psychology, yeah? You read about it and you know uh, that the world is a bit more, more complex than you think. You look at literature and you see the characters that are so unreal, so disconnected with the real life, so unbelievable, so unbelievable, you says you can't believe in them, they're implausible. You want something different, you want a different, you, you want a different novel. Here, uh, you have another interesting thing, parallel development with poetry. In the Romantic age and in the Victorian age, Poetry and prose developed some kind of, well, they took different paths, let's put it like this. Uh, we don't know, we don't know a lot of romantic novels. We do not see, uh, of, uh, if we look at romantic poetry and romantic prose, we again see slightly different things. We have this realism in, in the novel and we see this uh, pessimism and struggle for uh, aesthetic and uh, maybe emotional understanding of the world of poetry. Here, you use pretty much the same technique. So, what was there for the for poetry? Object, subjectivity, colloquial language, um, uh, distorted viewpoints. It is there. It is in prose. So, objectivity versus subjectivity. In, uh, in modernist novel, uh, we no longer see the attempt on the writer's part to grasp the world 
as it should be, as it is. No. We, uh, now we have uh, uh, now we have first person narratives rather than third person narratives. Uh, well, um, uh, or it is third person narrative, but actually, um, actually trying to trying to show what what the character feels. So uh, our narrators are no longer omniscient. They do not know everything. The narrator doesn't know everything. Uh, the narrator actually knows as much as a character feels. So, uh, uh, so not not a, not a missing narrator pose a problem because as a reader you, you know you don't know much. You don't have the advantage of knowing everything. Uh, the novel focuses on subjective experiences of your personal feelings about the world and about life. Uh, the novel also switches from the world of public values to the world of private values. If we look at Charles Dickens, for example, we, we can feel this kind of moralizing tone with Dickens giving us bad, bad characters, good characters, and actually telling us how the world should be, well, how life, life should be led, how, um, how a character, even though he might do something bad, can have his or her bad moments, well, actually turns out to be nice. No. And actually caring about worldly uh, values. No, it does not happen here. Uh, uh, and what this novel focuses on what is important for you personally. Uh, for example, in Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, we see the world from the perspective of an upper class lady, Clarissa Dalloway, who doesn't care much about the world around her uh, as long as it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect her. In Jane Joyce's Ulysses, we see the world, we see Dublin in one day uh, through the eyes of that old blue who focuses on his thoughts. Uh, and we see the, the, uh, the same day through, through, the, uh, through the eyes of his wife, Molly Blue, uh, who has a love affair with, with, a, with a different man, not her husband, and who focuses on her sexual experiences from this love affair. Which is again something you would not normally write about in the Victorian era. Well, the concept of plot and character as a model to follow is questioned. If we look at the Victorian novel, we will see a very straightforward plot. Well, you definitely remember about Oliver Twist, all the Christmas Carol, yeah, about Scrooge. You, well, if you haven't read the book yet, you will have definitely seen the cartoon, yeah? So, well, we have a story. This rich guy, Scrooge, he is being bad, well, something happens to him, and he rethinks his life, yeah? Well, uh, or we have the big house with this, well, more or less straightforward narrative. We have very straightforward narratives in, let's say, uh, Robinson Crusoe. Yeah, Robinson Crusoe finds himself on this island, lives his life, gets rescued, end of story. Here, well, we don't have plots as such. Well, uh, in Ulysses, for example, well, one of the key books of Mortis Ulysses in, uh, in Russian, well, Leopold Blue wanders around the city for a whole day. Other characters go on with their lives doing their business. Well, they meet at one place at the end of the day. Uh, but there is no plot. You, well, this is basically all, uh, uh, all I can tell you about the book, well, in terms of retelling the plot, because there is none. In uh, Clarissa, oh, I'm sorry, not in Mrs. Dalloway, by um, Virginia Woolf, 
the story, uh, uh, well, uh, in, well, the storyline, the plot, can be retold in one sentence. Clarice, an upper, an upper class lady, Clarice Delaway, prepares a party and wants to buy flowers. And these flowers invoke thoughts in her head. Uh, pretty much the same you get in all other modernist writers. In French, modernism in Marcel Proust, uh, in his Recherche de Temps Perdu, uh, in, uh, in the search of the time long long, we have the main character who, upon inhaling the air, smells cookies, smells, uh, smells, 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 smells a cookie, and this, uh, the cookie, the type of Madeleine cookie, and this smell of a cookie invoked memories, and well, we are there with his memories, no not. Character. Well, in the modernist novel we do not have characters as uh, uh, in the Victorian sense of the character, meaning uh, a personage with a set of characteristics behaving according to the set of characteristics and developing into something better or degrading into something worse or staying pretty much at the same level. So something, a, a kind of person you, you could see or see a model for somebody. Again, let's look at Charles Dickens. We have Mr. Pickwick from Pickwick Papers. Well, Mr. Pickwick is a character. We have uh, well, we can look even at uh, Sherlock Holmes, who is a character. He has a set of characteristics and he behaves according to the set of characteristics. Here in the modernist novel, uh, we do not see the character as such because the characteristics of, of a person are not known. How do I know my characteristics and if I cannot go beyond my own feelings? Well, does that also have characteristics? No, he does not. He moves around the city, he sees things, he thinks, he, he makes observations, but does he have characteristics? Not explicitly. And next thing is the question of time. Uh, the novels of the Victorian era and earlier novels, most of them, were chronological novels with certain uh, slight alterations. For example, you could, you, could, uh, you normally uh, had one storyline which developed from beginning to an end. Again, like with David Copperfield. We first see David Copperfield as a young boy. Yeah. And then he gradually progresses. Or we can put the beginning, uh, the end at the very beginning, uh, but again, then we stick to this chronological what like in the Wandering Heights. We see the ending is first, everybody is dead, now I'm telling the story how it happened, but then it still goes chronological. Uh, we, do, we see very chronological stories in most 18th century uh, writing. For example, in, uh, in, again, in Robinson Crusoe. Well, it's all chronological, we begin. With, uh, with Robinson sailing off and then with the Robinson returning. There is one huge exception uh, uh, which, uh, which made modernism in a sense no big deal. Uh, Virginia Woolf, a prominent modernist writer, in one of her essays, well, her essay on literature, pointed out that actually the first person to experiment with time and with narrators in a very modernist fashion was a person who would not ever, ever, ever call himself a modernist. A person who experimented with the form of the novel, with the language, with the characters, with introducing the characters who cannot say anything, with the characters who are not actually even characters was, you know this writer from the 18th century, it's Lawrence Stern. Again, uh, Lawrence Stern's Tristram uh, 
handy if you're again if you remember what, what, the, what that we talked about well what what we uh, what we discussed during uh, our discussion of Christian Shandy is a very modernist novel in this sense. Well, you experiment with time. Well, for Christ's sake, you begin the story before the story begins. You end the story before it actually started to unravel. You experiment with language. Well, yes, you do. Uh, well, with form of the novel, yes, you do. With characters, you, well, you, you speak on behalf of the characters who are not yet even being born. Well, Tristram tells us the story, but he cannot tell the story. Uh, again, in the modernist novel, the time doesn't go from beginning to end. The novels are never chronological. Well, uh, several storylines go in parallel. People go back and forth in time. For example, in, in Mrs. Dalloway, Clarissa Dalloway finds his, well, we begin the story in the here and now, in the nine, in 1923. But suddenly, well, Clarissa smells flowers and she goes back like 20 years in time, in her, in her younger years when she had to make a choice of husband. And when she kissed that girl Sally, and she well, and from that past she goes back to present, and then back to past, to present, to past, to present, to past, and but at the very same time, all those shifts happen in the head of the well character, if we may call her a character. So the concept of time uh, is very much rethought. So with all this said, major themes. Isolation and loneliness. Well, uh, in the Victorian novel, we do not see a lot of really lonely characters. No, it's like lonely. Certain characters are lonely for some time, uh, but they're not lonely all the time. Even uh, David Copperfield is not lonely all the time. Here, all our characters are lonely, they're isolated, they never feel communion with others. And they seek out for that communion, but they can't, can't get it because, well, we are so well because everybody else is isolated. So disconnection with society. Mm. Yes, people, people are disconnected in the sense they never feel themselves as a part of this big, huge social unity. Rather, they feel like they are, well, individuals. On their own in this sea of people who are also on their own moving about their business. Difficult relationship with other individuals. Again, people are unable to communicate. We, we especially we see this in Ulysses with uh, Leopold Bloom trying to get through to his son and not getting through until the very end of the novel. In uh, T.H. Lawrence's uh, short story, Captain's Doll, we have, well, it's novella basically, uh, we have uh, people who want to, to discuss their relationships but can't, uh, either because they don't want to or because they don't, or don't know how to discuss it. New narrative techniques, yes. Uh, you remember we talked about Freud and the subconscious and the way our mind works. So we never, uh, so what we stress is not right, we never think in this structured chronological order. Even now, in your thoughts, you go back and forth. In, in the past, you recollect certain things from yesterday. In the future, you think of the break that is ahead and of the queue you will have to stand in order to buy your, your cup of coffee. Uh, you think of the things that will come in a in several months' time, or suddenly you think about unrelated things like uh, what it would be like to be now on the shores of the Sea of the Mediterranean under the, the slum sun, well, with a cocktail and, uh, and the waves crashing. So all those are pleasant. Again, so this this technique is called stream of consciousness. The way you can use it. Uh, which is Potoxus Nagy. Uh, well, the way you can use it. Well, you can do it like it was in Ulysses, like all small letters, 
no punctuation, so it goes like the thought curve. Or it can be more like Lawrence and Virginia Woolf with standard syntax, but, but really good imitation of how we go back and forth in our minds. And new use of metaphor and autonomy. Uh, Victorian literature had relied heavily on metaphor. Uh, we have a lot of metaphors in Dickens, uh, in Hardy, in many other novels. Whereas in, the, in modernist writing we have metonymy, so we basically use one object, well, part of an object, to, dis to describe the whole. For, uh, for example, in, uh, uh, in E.M. Foster, uh, Foster's book, um, A Passage to India, we have a description of a city given through a description of the river that flows through the city. So, uh, a huge passage of the book is metonymic. In the sense you describe the river, but you are well, describing the river, you actually describe the city and the country. Uh, again, this switch back to metaphor will, go, will come into post postmodernism, and actually the use of both metaphor and metonymy will come a bit later. For example, in uh, in the H. Lawrence Captain's Doll, we have this doll of, of, the, of the main protagonist, the male character, the man who had his love affair with the girls. Uh, and how one of the girls was making this doll of the captain and how then she um, how how pleasant it was, well it was beautiful but at the very same same time it was ugly. And you feel yes the captain yeah, yeah, the doll is there, the, the doll is used as uh, uh, is this part of the capital that we want to, uh, want to be shown. Again, if we want, well, I had to, well, uh, since I have very little time, I had to uh, choose one writer, one modernist writer, and I thought it would be nice to choose a woman, Virginia Woolf. Well, a pleasant girl. Well, probably you know her as from the Gitches Gaiella, a meme from the internet. So, which is, which is not the kind of fame Virginia Woolf would have imagined she would have in Russia, but still. So, Virginia Woolf, one of the most influential writers of her age, a person who lived a modernist life and who died a modernist death. So, uh, born into a wealthy and very intellectual family, suffered from bipolar disorder, she had mental issues, committed suicide uh, at the age of 59 by simply drowning herself in the river because she, just, she thought that she can't go on. So, use this true of consciousness technique, the one I had discussed previously. So, wrote on a wide range of themes from our uh, well, 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 she wrote about virtually about everything. So there is nothing that Jenny Wolf hadn't written about. Or, well, if it existed in her time, she wrote about it. Well, a great campaigner for feminism. A person who did for the feminist movement more than probably anybody. Uh, in her famous essay, Room of One's Own, well, she gives a very good burning for, uh, for, the, um, for the fate of a woman who wants to be a writer. So a woman who wants to be a novelist should have a room of her own and some money to support herself. Well, every woman would want a room of her own and some money to support herself. So, again, this is a big feminist idea and in order to be independent. So, she wrote about modernism. She is one of the echoes of the few people, a few writers of the modernist era, who actually tried to, to, tell, uh, to explain what modernism is. So, she very often used unreliable narrators, so the, the characters who tell us the story, but you can't necessarily believe them, either because they are mentally ill, or because they see very little, or because they simply have very distorted visions. For example, in Mrs. Dalloway, one, one of the narrators is a former soldier suffering from 
mental disorder and the way we see the world through his eyes is a very distorted vision. And again, a lot of social criticism. In her, well, unlike many other modernist writers, she tried to explore the social problems of her time and her age. And she does this very ardently. At the very same time, she is often accused of really controversial views. Sometimes, well, anti-Semitic sometimes. Sometimes she is very harsh on certain social groups. Uh, so again, her writing is not very uh, is, it can be rather troublesome. Oh, uh, okay, no, back, back to the Okay, if we if we need to name one book, uh, well, from what is, I would have normally say Ulysses, but since you are a group that would like to read something that is readable, I suggest you read a very brief, very thin book by the Chinese called Flush, a biography. So Flush is a very minor book written in 1933. It's a biography of a dog. Well, not exactly of a dog. It's a biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning, a poet, a wife of Robert Browning, told from the perspective of her dog, Flush. Well, imagine a biography of a poet told by her dog. Well, um, and in this, it's a very nice, it's a very cute book. In this, well, do you love, well, if you love dogs, you will love the book because it's written very plausibly. Uh, so it's a, it's a book written from the perspective of a cocker spaniel. Uh, well, uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning did indeed have this kind of dog, and she dedicated three poems to it. Well, and these three poems were the basis for the biography. So the dog is an unreliable narrator because the, do the dogs do, do not understand much about poetry. Well, and this dog understands her, her owner, Elizabeth Barrett Brown, not through words because dogs don't understand words, but she understands her through smells. And um, again, we have these ideas of stream of consciousness unreliable narrates and theories of politics. How can, how can you communicate if for you words, if you are the poet and, and words that words matter for you? And and on the other side you have the dog who doesn't know words but knows smells. And somehow she shows how this code of words and code of smells can be translated into this universal code that allows the dog and the and it's also to is again very nice and pleasant. Um, the flush, again, we also see the evolution of flush as a dog. Well, uh, flush is versus a very poshy doggy, but after the family goes to Rome and returns from Rome, and where flush had the chance to meet with ordinary dogs from the streets, uh, he becomes more socialist and more egalitarian of a Spaniel. Which again, it, it is a very good uh, idea of social criticism through the perspective of the dog. And there is also social criticism there. And probably the most important episode is when Flash is stolen for ransom. So he is stolen and then note comes if you want your dog back, pay us six pounds forty pence, which is a lot of money at this point. And again, this very tear-provoking story actually shows that certain people have enough money to, to buy back the dog from the thieves, whereas others have to steal the dog in order to, in order to survive. Um, so this was practically all I wanted to share about modernism so far. Uh, again, as, as, as promised, the lecture would be put online. I hope I'll try to do it today. At least I'll try to. And again, there will be well, a test on the top, and the presentation will also be there. So if you missed out something about 